Okay. All right. So, as is our tradition now at LAC, we've got the chance to explore further. You know, we fly these people from all over the world. It's always nice to have the chance for a longer conversation. So, this is really open floor to uh, pick up on whatever fascinated, annoyed, or whatever you in what David had to say. So, who wants to kick things off? Don't be bashful. Okay, down at the front here. Can we get a mic there? Thank you. And is there somebody else who wants to go next? We'll get the mic to you. Well, Simon, you did say annoyed, so I'll, I'll, do <laughs> I'll put this out. Excellent. So one <laughs> thing that I struggle with when doing things in this area where you've done some dimensionality reduction and you're trying to represent a network is the visualization part. So could you just say really briefly how those were made? Because they were gorgeous. And I, were those artistically done or programmatically done? Uh, th so those were... Hello, hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those are those are not artistically done. They're programmatically done, um, and <coughs> actually the the visual component of epistemic net network analysis was one of the core one of its core design features from the start. Uh, in a, in a couple of different ways, and this actually comes back to Pip's question earlier about like what what trade offs have we made in 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 choosing this approach. Uh, so the the original inspiration, if you will, for epistemic network analysis was, uh, was social network analysis in the sense that if you imagine a, a cocktail party or a conference here, whatever, uh, and you try to construct a social network of, uh, of relationships by just kind of taking a snapshot and when two people are you know, talking to each other, facing each other or, or closely located, you uh, asserted a connection between them and then you just add up over all the snapshots, you would get a sociogram of the party. So the, uh, the, the epistemic network analysis is doing something that is basically the same except that the people at the party are the actual concepts and the skills, the knowledge, the values, the codes that we care about in some domain. So the analogy is, is fairly direct. Uh, <coughs> the problem is that most SNA techniques and most network analysis techniques are not really designed for networks of the kind that we, ju that we just saw, right? So the qualities that, that matter in these networks are there's a very small number of nodes. The nodes are exactly the same from network to network, um, at least in any set that you're reasonably comparing. Um, they're extremely dense networks, meaning that almost every connection occurs at some point in time. Um, and all of the action is in the weights, in the weights between the nodes. Um, and so uh, most visualizations in, in network analysis aren't, aren't really very well designed to compare two networks. Um, and most network analytics, most summary statistics um, are much more useful on networks that are much, much sparser and have much, many, many more nodes. Right? So things like betweenness centrality and uh, um, you know, uh, clicks, uh, click analysis and those sorts of things don't really work well if it, if in, in a set of networks where everything is all connected. And nobody really, uh, except for some, in some, longi you know, some longitudinal studies, you're not usually comparing <coughs> the same set of stuff over time. So, uh, so that's where the, that, that's why we, we, and we tried a bunch of, we, we used like, you know, spring mass models. Well, if you know anything about spring mass embedding models, they, uh, they don't, they're not deterministic. So from time to time, you can get a different layout and it's impossible to compare things. So, th so that's, where the, th that's where the kind of impetus behind this particular visual visualization came from. And I don't wanna go, I mean, I'm happy to go deep into the math, but I imagine people have other questions. Um, so what we're essentially doing is, uh, you can think of that, of that matrix, that is the, the uh, association matrix. Um, oh, uh, so it's symmetrical in the case of ENA. Um, and in part deliberately so, but uh, so one tri the upper triangle of the matrix contains all the information. So just imagine that you took that upper triangle and just strung it out as a vector. Now I have a position in, the, in this high dimensional space where each of the dimensions is the co-occurrence of two codes. So then we do a dimensional reduction. There's a few different techniques we've used, others we've tried. Um, we get the projection down. Um, and now the question is, what sense can you make of that of those positionings in space? And that's where the, the that's where this the kind of visual piece, which is the placing of the nodes so as to make the points interpretable, 
And the basic insight there is that when you look at a graph or you look at two graphs and compare them, what you're looking at is the density of the, of the lines in two different places, in, in different places. Right? That's sort of the, the biggest visual cue that you get when you're comparing two networks. I mean, if something's missing, obviously, but two dense networks, you're looking for where the stuff is. And so the centroid, mm -hmm. center of mass, is a useful summary statistic for that. And so what we do is we position the nodes so that the centroid of the resulting network graphs correspond with the projected points. And now, if something is on the, if a point is on the right side of the space, the connections that it makes are on the right side of the space. If the point is on the left side, the connections are on the left side, up and down similarly. And what that means is you can use the layout of the network graph to, uh, to interpret the axes of the space and make sense of what the difference is. And for those of you who are familiar with like principal components analysis, it's pretty much it's the same sort of thing. There's a few differences in the math. It's just that the principal components now are not the individual variables, but the, the, paired va the pairs of variables. And if you want to, if you want to really kind of go all the way into the math piece of it, an easy way to think about this, easy, easy way to think about this, is so imagine, uh, imagine we have any two codes, just call them A and B, right? And there's a line connecting them. So that there's an A, there's an A B dimension in the original space and its basis vector starts at the origin and hits the midpoint of that line. Okay. This is all, it's all approximated because of course it's a dimensional reduction, there's a lot more information, but that's essentially what we're doing with the, with the diagram. So a uh, long way around both explaining the math but also saying like with the, I think the visualization is critical. And part of the reason we don't do directed models, you can, we can do a directed model. It's just that um, what you get in a, so there's this interesting thing that happens in, in like social networks and a lot of other networks. We make an assumption that the sender and the receiver, the, the sender and the receiver function of a person or of a node is, is, the same, is in the same place in the space. And there's no particular reason to assume that, right? So in an ENA network, in order to make the math work, you have to, sp you have to split those. So you have a, a sending and a receiving version of each node, and it's just it's hard to interpret. It's hard to make sense of. Um, so we typically don't do it unless the model absolutely requires it. Okay, thank you, David. It's nice when you ask a question like that and the answer isn't, oh, that took my postdoc three weeks to lay out that graph. You know, No, it just happens. No, that's and, and that's we a mark of the maturity <laughs> of the work, I think, right? Yeah, we have a web kit, yeah. upload the data, produces exactly those diagrams. Um, you can have some Very control nice. over like the size and color of things. Okay, um, okay, here we have another question then. Pip, okay, uh, can we get a mic to Pip? Thank you. Thanks, David. I'm a social network nut, as you can probably tell. Um, so you've also got temporal associations in the data between the speakers. Um, have you looked at whether there's any value in thinking about learning through the social relationships um, that are revealed through the conversational structure? So I know lots of people in this community do think about social relationships as relevant to learning, and I just wondered whether you've gone down that track. Yeah, so all, uh, lots of credit to uh, Dragon, who's sitting just over here, but um, uh, one of the things that we realize is that, just as you say, there's both a social network and an epistemic network at play in play at the same time. Um, so we've done some work looking at uh, comparison of features of the social network and features of the epistemic network. So for example, uh, do groups with high Smilian ties, which is something that Dragon's been investigating, have particular net, uh, places in the epistemic network space. But there's something else we can do, and that is actually combine the two networks. Right? So what you were seeing was an epistemic network space in which individual uh, part uh, students were placed. Those students were actually working in groups. <coughs> and, and so just as we induce an epistemic network out of the data. We can induce the social network out of the data. It's basically, you just have a code for each person and each line is coded by whoever speaks. You use exactly the same math and it produces the social network model. Um, and so now you can, pr you, can, you can place that sociogram or any sociogram on top of the positions in the network space and you can flip it, right? So you could use the, the social space to define the positions of the codes and then produce the epistemic network on top of them. The nice thing about that is just as you saw the kind of drilling down effect, right? So 
a way of thinking about that is I could drill down into any one of the connections in the epistemic space and I could see the network, the social network that had produced it. I can drill down into any social connection between two people and see the epistemic network that that represents. Um, and there's another trick, and the thanks go to Roberto, who's not, uh, who's not here right now. Um, but uh, you can also think about the communications channels. So you actually have three different networks, all of which are in an isomorphic relationship to one another. You can, so you can view it sort of through, the, through any one lens. You can view it through the social network embedded in the epistemic, the epistemic in the social, the communications channel in the social, and, and so on, all the way around. There surely is one. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we, we, just, we literally have just uh, put together the, the, the math, actually, and the code to produce the networks together, and we're just starting to, to see what happens when you actually frame it that way. But yes, there will be something. I just don't know what it is. OK, thank you. Uh, yep, we've got a question here. Thank you. So I'm just wondering. What's the interaction between students and these models? Is there a pedagogy around that? How are you talking to students about these models? Yeah, so, um, <coughs> so there's a, f the, the question is, so once you produce a model like this, like what do you do with it? It's helpful obviously as researchers to get some insight into the phenomenon and so on, but um, uh, we've looked at uh, communicating a mo models like these to uh, teachers or to students. We've tended to focus on teachers because it's easier to ask their opinion than students. But, um, and the first thing you discover is you shouldn't show them that <laughs> for all the obvious reasons. Um, so uh, what we did, I showed you a, a quick sketch of an interface, but we did some work um, looking at various representations of the information in the network for teachers. Uh, so if, if you think about it, there's no particularly natural way to show a set of network relations. You could pick the things that are most strongly related and show those. You could say, look, we know what a good network looks like and here's the things that are you're missing. There, uh, we looked at one, there was like positives and negatives and pull, all of which were a mess. It turned out that when we showed the mock-ups to teachers, what they said is, no, I just want to see the network. Um, because it gives them a sense of the space in which the students are operating. Sorry, I just want to see what? what the network. They actually want to see the network. They want to see yeah, the network. They don't want to see a digested version of it. They want to see the actual thing. Um, but what they don't care about so much is the, is, the, is the spatial embedding work that we've done to create an interpretive space. So instead, what we do is we lay out the network in some way that looks pretty. This is back to Danielle's question. We actually, you know, we get a, somebody, a graphic designer, to lay out the network for some particular instance. Um, and then we use uh, color to indicate which of the no which of the connections are the most critical to be made that the students are supposed to be making at whatever point in time it is, and we typically position the layout so that those critical nodes are kind of all in one place. The critical connections are in one place, and then the other ones kind of hang off of it. Uh, so that that's that has that's been pretty effective um, in uh, uh, in working with teachers. Uh, one of the features that we built into that system is the the ability to um, scroll through time. So the, the that uh, representation that I showed you had the network, and then it had the actual uh, data that the network was being built from. And if you scroll back in time through the data, the network deconstructs and then reconstructs. So you can actually get a kind of integrated picture of where the net, where how the network is forming and where the critical moments are. Um, you can also see like the codes and the, and the data and so forth. Um, and so uh, teachers have teachers tend to use that the, um, retrospectively. So in class, in the moment, even if you're showing that representation, there's so much going on for a teacher that it's very difficult to consume the representation in real time. So they tend to look at it retrospectively. Um, there were teachers who talked about showing the networks to the to their students. I don't think that ever wound up happening, although their idea was this would be a great teaching tool as to what makes good uh, good discussion. Uh, the I would say the the biggest challenge is that you know the the teachers are doing exactly what I was talking about with that is. The, they're literally zooming in on the specific things that are happening and how that's changing the network. And the challenge is that, you know, 
this stuff is all, autom the coding is automated because you couldn't produce the networks fast enough or enough of them. Um, automated coding always has uh, an error rate, right? And the teachers key right in on the errors, right? And so as soon as they see something that doesn't really correspond to what they want, what they think it should correspond to, that, that's problematic for them. Right? Because they, it, it's, it's like the difference between population statistic, level statistics and individual statistics, right? On the population level, we shouldn't take antibiotics as much as we do. On an individual level, when you're the one who's sick, you probably want the antibiotics, right? And so the, the teachers are doing the same sort of thing. On a population level, the model is accurate. But when I'm talking about, you know, Timmy's grade or giving feedback to Timmy, I really need the accuracy to be very high. And so that's, that's independent of the specific visualization, but that's a, that's a generic challenge. And that's why the meaning question is so important. Because when people are making consequential decisions, th they, they want to know that if they go down all the way to the ground, that, it's, that it, the thing is supported accurately. Can I jump in there? Um, so this is really quite tantalizing, right? You've built this platform. It can generate these things in real time. Um, and many of us here are thinking, oh, let's close the loop and get it back to the educators and the learners, not just an amazing power tool for researchers. But we have this dilemma that it's not perfect, and you're saying educators are going to latch on to that. We also have the dilemma, oh, well, if the educators don't want to see, aren't, you know, are going to latch onto that, then the students will too. I put it to you, uh, because we've been thinking about this quite a lot, that even if it's an imperfect representation, it could be put back to the students to provoke reflection and to push back and disagree if necessary, but they're having the right conversation at that point. Yeah. Um, now, it's not to say whether the ENA is the right representation. That's, that's another trap we fall into in, in learning analytics. We can generate something that we can understand, so we think we'll feed it back to the students because we've got the data, and for some egalitarian reason, we must share that back to the students, which may not be helpful. But if someone, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a huge opportunity for the next person to pick up the baton and say, we have this amazing engine, but we now need to do some very good user experience design with students to figure out what would be helpful. But even if it's not perfect, it could actually be uh, useful still. Yeah, so part, I agree 100%. Um, and I think part of the challenge is that uh, the, these teachers anyway, we're very much seeing the an important role of the data that they were receiving as being um, <coughs> uh, for the purposes of assessment. Summative right? assessment. Well, not necessarily summative, mm -hmm. but um, uh, but yeah, but they were they were actually planning to use it for some summative assessment. Okay. So that that is obviously raises the stakes. Exactly. But if it's formative feedback for reflection. Right. And the the but the question is how how do you actually make sure that that distinction that the distinction holds for your users, right? So especially if you're a student, how do you assure a student, how do you convince a student that this very mathematical representation that compares their performance to other students' performances isn't somehow gonna be, I'm not saying, uh, clearly it doesn't have to be, mm. but there it's a, that's a part of the, either the UX, the UX design writ large, not just of the, that particular interface, of the whole system in which it sits has to somehow be designed to make sure that the students yeah, and, and so teachers perceive it that interesting way. Interesting questions around how transparent or you know in accountable or interpretable the model is. Right. And, and, and how much students need to understand or not. Yeah, absolutely. And to, just to give a uh, kind of quick anecdote around that, um, <laughs> we were, um, we show one of the, one, in one, at one point when we were showing this, these models to the, to the teachers we were working with to get feedback about how the models were functioning, one of them asked, not surprisingly, well, how do you, how do you get the, how do you induce the coding, right? How do you know what they're talking about? And so we said, well, it's a, it's a regular expression-based coding system, blah, 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 right? And I, you know, the, the, so they don't know what a regular expression is, but these, these teachers didn't. Anyway. So we said, it's sort of like keywords. <laughs> and so the teacher said, well, can you give us the list of keywords so that we can teach them to the students so that they'll perform well? <laughs> And I, I, yeah. I had a good answer for that, and it was both polite and accurate and explained why that probably wasn't a good idea. But um, <coughs> there, there is a sense in which the, 
the norms of what, of what data means and what we do with it in a, in a pedagogical context are, go very deep. And, and I think that's what LAC is about, you know, is exploring how that dialogue happens as well. You know, we develop something with potential. How, what, what, what are the steps to actually get that engaged with, with practitioners? Okay, we should jump to another question right here. Yep. Uh, let's just get it on the mic for the recording then. I, um, I have a question sort of following on from that. Um, I'm wondering if it m might be helpful. You, when you were in your talk, you, you noted that you're using epistemic network analysis in a range of different fields. And I was wondering what problems did um, those fields have that, that, um, that were answered in, in terms of shedding light on the, on the use in, in the learning situation? Yeah, so I mean, w so certainly one of the things that happens, uh, one of the reasons that we are very active in seeking collaborators around the use of the tools that we developed is not just that we think that they're good tools and not just that, you know, that's Mindshare and everybody wants Mindshare. It's actually that we learn something from every new domain that we encounter because there are properties that, that, uh, that are of interest in that domain that we haven't necessarily thought about before. So uh, for example, when we've looked at um, discussions of controversial issues, right, one of the things that you really care about there is uh, not just the uptake side of things, you care about the extent to which somebody is, is an influential member of the discussion and that's where you, want, you actually want to run the model the other way. You want to see what follows from a, a given uh, turn of talk or turn, or turn rather than what, what led up to it. Um, similarly, in, uh, in medical education, I mean, not surprisingly, if you're looking at surgeons, like you care about like, what they're doing with their hands, um, but also you care about what they're doing with their minds and with their mouths, right? So you, how they're thinking about a problem and what they're doing are both important pieces. So the a multi multimodal analysis is really important. And one of the things we saw in that case is if you look at um, surgeons in a simulator, uh, if you just look at what they do, you can't tell the difference between the experts and the novices. And if you just listen to what they say to their operative team as they're working in the simulator, you can't tell the difference between experts and novices. It's only when you put the two together um, so, and this is, it's not entirely surprising once you see the result, right? But um, <coughs> beforehand, we didn't necessarily know to expect it, and it's that everybody makes mistakes. So if you're just looking at what their hands are doing, it's, that's not sufficient. Um, and uh, <coughs> everybody talks about the procedure and, you know, planning and so on. What matters is the conjunction of those things. So what makes the expert surgeons experts is as soon as the mistake happens, they start diagnosing the problem and then making a plan going forward. The novices flounder around. Um, and so it's, that, it's, the, it's the combination. Um, and so that was actually one of our first forays into a multimodal uh, epistemic network analysis. Um, and it, it's, so it's very revealing both about the technology and about the, the field. Um, I haven't been as close to some of the other analyses, but people have looked at the way mentors operate, and they can see diff pattern, different patterns between uh, mentors. So it's it's a useful lens on a lot of fields. Is that uh, is that an answer to your question, Marlon? Okay, I think we might have time for one more question. So, uh, uh, yeah, Adam, just down there. Yep. Okay, I'm intrigued about the coding. Do you uh, attempt to determine codes by reference to something like a, a textbook or other source that would have a kind of a I guess a somehow normalized view about what the codes might be, or is it purely based upon the exchanges which you've recorded? Uh, yes, you, we, we, you can do it. We, we have done it both ways, and it can be done both ways. I mean, obviously, the challenge with the textbook approach is that people don't speak in textbook language. Um, so typically, what you would be doing is using the, text, using the textbook or expert interviews or something like that to determine what the big C codes are, and then you have to go and look at the data and try and see what the small C codes are. I didn't mention in the talk, but we've actually developed a coding tool. Um, so, so coming back in a way to Danielle's question about, uh, you know, how much of this is automated, right? If you actually want valid valid codes, um, somebody has to code a bunch of stuff by hand, and uh, so uh, like it, things like topic modeling or other very automated uh, machine uh, learning coding processes, right, work really quick except that you don't know whether the codes are any good, and you have to actually code a bunch of data to, to check. And when it's not good, it's not clear what to do to fix it. Um, <coughs> you can also take the approach of code a bunch of data in advance and give it to the 
the machine and let it extract the features, but you have to have like thousands of lines of coded data. So we started out by saying, look, <laughs> let's, op let's figure out a process here that optimizes for the least amount of coding that a human has to do. And so we have an active machine learning process that lets you seed the, the code set, the, the classifier, and then iteratively refine it. Um, and all of that works because we have a statistical test for the significance of the inter-rater reliability that you've achieved. If you don't have that, you have no way of knowing when to stop the loop. Um, and it's the tool, tool's called Encoder. I, I write about it in the, the book, and we're, we're having a, we have an R package that's going to probably come out later this semester. Um, but uh, yeah, the the coding is a is is a critical step, and I don't see any way of taking humans entirely out of the loop if you want something that's valid. Um, so e even if you were to like do some kind of content analysis across the wik Wikipedia pages for all of the things related to the content, which we have people have done, somebody would still have to look at it. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. I do just want to commend to you David's book, which is written unlike any other academic book you've ever read. It's just extraordinarily accessible, you know, uh, for a wide range of students uh, and, and researchers. Uh, I learned a lot from it myself as well. David, thank you once more for being under the spotlight. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Uh, many more conversations to happen for the rest of the week. Let's thank David. Thank you very much, and Simon, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we are moving into a discussion panel led by Stephanie Teasley, and we have some senior leaders whom we've invited, and Stephanie will introduce that.